So Claire Orange is Drive's parenting expert. She's here to answer all your questions. I won't dominate today, so feel free. one 322 720 if you've got any questions to ask Claire, or you can send us a text to 0437 922 720. Claire, don't get me wrong, but a lot of families, well, some will be looking forward to the school holidays. No school, there's a chance to spend some time together. But for others, I reckon it might be a bit of an endurance test. What do you do knowing you've got these long weeks ahead? How do you find stuff to do with the kids? Yeah, well, there's lots of stuff. And I think now we thankfully live in that age of, of, uh, you know, Facebook where they put all the fantastic free things for families in your local area out there. So, you know, plan plan things to do. You know, I'd encourage parents, even though it's really nice to have that downtime, especially for the first two weeks over Christmas and New Year, there's lots on. And then after that, it's a bit of a long stretch into the school holidays and that last week of the school holidays can get pretty dire for kids because they're feeling anxious about going back. Um, and they've also had enough of you and had enough of their siblings and, <laughs> and even swimming's really boring. So, you know, you need to you need to have all these things planned, not just for the first bit, but for your entire holiday so that there's a bit of downtime and then a bit of up and out time. As an outstanding sibling squabbler, my <laughs> sister and I, dead said it was like WWE at times, minus occasionally the chair throwing, but everything else was involved. How can you sit down and try and tell your kids look, don't fight with your sister. Or, of course, in my family's case, don't fight with your brother because I was a perfect child and did nothing wrong. I can tell by looking from you, but I would (laughs) not melt your poor sister. Um, Well, you know, I think as parents what we have to realise is that while we really wanted that child, maybe the sibling didn't want them quite as much and weren't brought into the planning phase of introducing a new human being. And sometimes it is that siblings are different genders, They are different ages, different stages. And even if they're the same gender, that they they might be completely different people. So expecting that they can spend all day together and get along is kind of ridiculous. So it's like any play date. You know, you don't say to someone, look, send me your kid for the rest of their life. <laughs> you say, pick him up at five. And, uh, you know, by then it's a bit fractured and fractious. So we kind of do that with siblings as well, is put them together for periods of time, help them to play constructively in that time, and then give them periods of time apart. You know, as parents, we kind of dump them in together and hope that it works. It doesn't always work out like that. Can you actually explain to them? Uh, like when do they start to be old enough that you can actually explain to them this level of behaviour is acceptable when it comes to dealing with your sister slash brother? Well, really, you're thinking at about four. Right. Uh, so before then, just... Before done. then, you've got a really emotionally unregulated kid who's just all about themselves. Mm. Question uh, from Francis on the uh, SMS line, which is 0437 922 720. If you have a particularly shy child, what can you do to try to bring them out of their shell? And that's particularly important, I would imagine, as we're about to go into scenarios where there's lots of people about. You've got big Christmas and Boxing Day lunches and dinners and you really don't want your youngest running and hiding on mum's skirts at every opportunity. What can you do to try to bring them out of their shell? Mm. All right. So, you know, when when shyness is an issue, it's when it stops a child forming a relationship. So it's a great question, Francis. And, you know, as part of what we teach children uh, through Best Program, for kids, one of the things we talk about is the friendliness spice. So there's five steps that you can practice with your daughter that help. So air, smile and say hello. You know, it's a great first step for a child. Then the P is pray, say something nice. I invite, like, um, I've got shoes like that. So how do you get into a conversation? A chat, which is practicing something to talk about, either something that's happened at school, a merit certificate, what they want for Christmas. And then the E is that body language of enjoyment. So for our children, those five steps are pretty fundamental for the shy child to practice with a parent or with a sibling in a role play so that when they're under the pressure, they have these five steps that they can run through that help them to get over that shyness to break the ice. Question from... Uh, Clint Wilden, who occasionally <laughs> hosts this program. My son has started sleeping about 12 hours at night, which I thought would be fantastic, except that it does mean we then have to sneak around the house in the morning where normally he would be up and about. But what it means is the day nap has disappeared. Yeah. 
Is that a problem when you're just two years of age? Well, you know, all kids are different. All kids' brains are different. You might be a night owl or you might be a, a morning person. Our, our little people are not the same. You know, they, they, they have their own pathway for sleep as well. For some children, they need that day sleep and they'll keep it on until, you know, five, even six years of age. Other kids will get rid of it by 12, 18 months and you're stuck with them all day. Um, what you will find is when they, when they come out of a day sleep, so either going from two sleeps down to one sleep or from one sleep, down to no sleeps, um, you will go through a period of six to eight weeks where there'll be a really big disturbance in their behaviour. So it'll affect their night sleep. So like you're getting a big 12-hour sleep and then nothing during the day. Don't expect that to last. Oh, that's this point. Yeah. <laughs> you'll find that it'll be up and down. But within six to eight weeks, his little brain will have regulated what he needs and how he's going to do it. So he might find that he'll go to a, a catch-up sleep every three or four days. Okay. And that will change his sleep pattern at night Should as well. We still put him down for a rest? Yes, absolutely. Every parent, until your child is at school, every day having some downtime, it's really good for human brains, for our brains and for our kids' brains. There's the benefit of playing without an adult watching, of playing imaginatively or creatively, playing quietly, playing in a self-sustaining way, yeah, Absolutely, very definitely, yes. Uh, and another question from um, M E me: uh, If your young bloke has decided that it's time to try and climb everything in the house, which, despite your best efforts, and we've done all everything you can do, every cupboard is drilled into the wall, anything that could possibly fall on him, the TV is drilled into whatever it happens to be nearby. But we're still worried, understandably, that if you climb something, you're a chance to land on your head. Hmm. Is there anything you can do to discourage that? Or is that just something, is that just one of the perils of parenting? It is one of the perils of parenting. And actually, you know, for those kids who are climbers, some kids would never think about climbing anything. Other kids who are climbers, you'll find that he actually probably has very well-developed physical skills anyway. He probably has good height, depth, perception. He probably has pretty good hand motor control. So you'll find that. Really? These are all good things for his cricketing career, they're, but they're not good for mum and dad in terms of seeing him climb health. up something. Yeah, exactly. yeah, they're not good for your mental health. But you'll find that actually, you know, control it as much as you can. But I I think sometimes we can over-worry about those things, about the head injury potential. And I know that, I mean, that's massive. So we do as much protection as possible. But know that if he's doing it, he's learning to take some risks as well. And as long as you're there and you're keeping him safe, and like you said, you've got everything bolted to all, you're doing all right. It's going to happen. It doesn't still fill me with a huge amount of confidence. <laughs> I do genuinely expect to come in um, one morning at 3am and find him on top of one of the cupboards because he loves climbing on anything and everything. Uh, yes, my, my fourth boy, from when he was nine months old, used to climb out of his cot and then let himself out of the door. So we had to put him in a bed because really at nine months you've got no clue. And, you know, he... Sorry, how old was he? Nine months. He used to climb, over, get his toes around the cot, climb up over the top and then let himself out the door. So, so uh, you know, that that was... It, it's dangerous when they're that little and climbing. But we provided lots of other opportunities for him to climb that were appropriate. And, so. and this sounds strange, but does that actually <laughs> encourage them to climb? Like, we love taking him to the park and getting him to climb up ladders and steps. and Not, not proper ladders, but you know what I'm referring to. Does that actually make him climb more at home? Or no. Does, no, it doesn't? No, that's just that's just what he is. He's, he's going to be one of those kids who's into everything, who's adventurous, who likes to find out. He's curious and he'll climb up to find the best option that he possibly can. That's the kid you've got. You're not encouraging him by taking him to the park. In fact, you're teaching him some really good safety because he's going to learn. He, he's, he's One way or another, he's going to learn. <laughs> Pretty fast. Heaven help us, Mel, if you're listening. Uh, Claire Orange is our parenting expert here on Drive. So we'll go back to what we started talking about in terms of school holidays and how important planning is for the kids to have something to do. What would be your greatest recommendation in terms of, you know, what is an age-appropriate thing? Let's go if you've got someone 
little bub under two, between, say, two and five, and then sort of five upwards. What would you be doing with them if there was a one thing you would recommend? What do you have to look at when you go about planning how to fill in your time? Right. Uh, fun. Fun for your child, not fun for you. So I often see lots of parents sitting in cafes. Uh, that's not fun for a kid. Uh, so don't plan that as your outing. Mm. Things where they're burning up energy. But your zero to two, really, your routine doesn't change that much because there are no such thing as school holidays for them. You know, <laughs> life is just an entire holiday. Your, your two to fives, they're going to be active, wanting more social opportunities, so plan those in. Find other parents, mums, dads, and do some organising and great opportunity to kind of dump and run and go off and do some Christmas shopping and then reciprocate and have those kids over. So you don't need to be doing anything expensive. It doesn't need to be play centres. Have, have a couple of kids over, let them play, and then you do the next thing and swap them over. Five plus... Generally, they like a bit more structure. They like a few more kids. So that's where you can go out and have a look for things. Shopping centres run really great stuff. Uh, There's lots of holiday programs as well, if that's what your child's into. But lots of kids really just want some downtime with some moments where they can go off and do some fun stuff too. Claire Orange, our parenting expert on Drive, thank you very much. No, really enjoy good. this little segment, get a little one-on-one time in terms of sorting out what's going on at home. Uh, looking forward to it. Well, Belinda will be back next week, but uh, have a great week. Speak to you soon. Thanks, Glenn. Claire Orange, parenting expert on Drive.